Reasonably Sound is a proud listener-supported podcast. If you like the show and want to help out, you can give a per-episode donation at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound and get access to the Reasonably Sound newsletter, Slack channel, and more. Or you could give a monthly recurring donation at d.rip forward slash micrognetta and get access to weird essays that I write and photos that I take and tons of other stuff. Yeah, we're still figuring that one out, but it's tons of fun. Come over and say hi, and let's get on with the show. Are there no new Christmas songs? Wait, no, I immediately take that back. Kelly Clarkson and Lady Gaga and Coldplay and a bunch of other very famous songsmiths. Not Sam Smith, though. He said that he hates Christmas music. A bunch of other very famous people have written original Christmas music. Their songs get played on the radio and in the Starbucks. And actually, right up front here, let's just have a moment of silence for every retail worker who, during this time of year, has to listen to the same 15 songs on repeat for like a month and a half straight. So, yes, there are new Christmas songs. Maybe what I'm asking is, why does it seem so hard to write a Christmas song with some persistence? It seems hard for Christmas music to gain a sort of resilience compared to other genres slash subject matters. When you ask Alexa to play Christmas music, that AI-assisted mix furnishes none surprises. Can we get, like, Bruno Mars or maybe Beyonce in on this to just, like, liven up these shallow holiday party playlists with some fresh Yuletide bangers? Why are, for lack of a better descriptor, classic Christmas songs so few and far between? This is complicated because we have to ask what makes something a classic and then what makes something a Christmas classic, which is a bit of its own beast, sort of like a Yeti, but the Yeti also has a record deal and international distribution. But we've faced down worse. First, we'll talk about the oldies, Jingle Bells et al., you know, the usual suspects, and we'll see what they all have in common. Then, we're going to appropriate some literary theory to talk about the old and the new to make a few guesses as to why it's been almost 25 years since the last Christmas hit. Oh, and also some disclaiming. First, this conversation is hyper-focused on the Western English language tradition of popular song, like it probably couldn't be any more focused there. Second, for what it's worth, I'm a non-religious person, though I do buy my friends and loved ones presents to be opened under, usually, a tree of some kind on December 25th. I don't love Christmas music, but I do find it fascinating. American librarian and carol expert William Studwell called Christmas music the most culturally dominant body of enduring or lasting songs in Western society. And, I mean, I disagree, but... Many of the songs in the Christmas music tradition are amongst the oldest you'll regularly hear and among a very few songs to which you may never willingly listen but still know all the words. That kind of puts them up there with like national anthems, church music, and other areas of folk song, so they're worth a Christmas goose of a gander. And finally, we should also recognize Christmas music's prevalence as a symptom of the hegemonic position Christianity occupies in Western popular culture. You can't really get a complete answer for why there aren't more popular Christmas songs without acknowledging the forces that result in the existence of popular Christmas anything, a detailed discussion of which is a bit beyond the scope of this here podcast. We're going to approach this question largely on the Christmas music tradition's own terms, and then I'm going to editorialize and complicate things a bit at the very end. For now, though, we're going to start easy with what makes something a carol? Stop. 
Studwell, the gent who thinks carols are the most culturally dominant body of songs in Western society, wrote in 1985 that a Christmas carol is a song used to celebrate Christmas and its adjacent events, including Advent, Epiphany, the New Year, and to some extent, the winter season. One of the more important characteristics of the carol is its long-term and widespread mass appeal. It is a phenomenon popular with diverse and varied segments of society. The carol is meant to be actively sung, played, and heard year after year by all types of persons. Sources in the show notes, by the way. So, Studwell prefers his definition over older ones because his avoids explicit requirements of religiosity, as well as stuff you see in other carol conceptions about ordinary men and common emotions. Like, yeah, what does that even mean? Ordinary where? Common to whom? Yeesh. Studwell sees carols as these persistent songs with diverse, not ordinary, appeal that are easily sung by whoever wants to get down. They help people come together and celebrate some aspect of the year's end, and they do so in such a way where people feel invited over and over again to use them towards that purpose. Using this as our starting point, I wonder if you'll indulge me in a little experiment. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds, and I would like you to think of, or if you can, write down, uh, because you're going to need to remember them, as many popular Christmas songs that fit this bill as you can. No Googling. Ready? I'm going to give you a few cheat seconds by making this sentence a little bit longer than it needs to be. Okay, 10 seconds, go. Nice work. Good list. Looks very promising. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds again and no Googling. For every song you just thought of or wrote down, please match it with the person who wrote it or the person who made it famous. Ready? Go. Okay, so you maybe got like Last Christmas, which is by Wham, and All I Want for Christmas is You by Queen of Christmas, Mariah Carey. We're going to talk at length about those later, but maybe you also got Wonderful Christmas Time by Paul McCartney and one newish pop song like Christmas Tree by Lady Gaga from 2008 or Underneath the Tree by Kelly Clarkson from 2013. But if you had no idea either of those ladies had written a Christmas song, none sweat, you are not alone. If you're a real nerd, you may have known that, say, White Christmas is by Irving Berlin, that Here Comes Santa Claus is a Gene Autry jam, or that Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire, actually titled The Christmas Song, was co-written by Mel Torme and made famous by Nat King Cole. They know that Santa's on his way. I would wager, though, that the more classic and classically overplayed we get, the less familiar the names. The two- and three-hundred-year-old carols are tough, for one, because many authors are either anonymous, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen is from the 16th century or earlier, or their authors have faded into obscurity. Oh, Holy Night was written in 1847 by Adolf Adam, a not unpopular French composer who wrote 39 operas and a bunch of ballets, but who isn't exactly topping the Spotify release radar these days. Since we're trying to figure out why it's hard to write a successful Christmas tune now, though not in the 17th century, we're going to leave the distant past behind and focus on the modern tradition of songwriting, where, as it turns out, that fading into obscurity thing, that's still a thing. If you don't know the authors or performers of the most recognizable Christmas music from the last hundred years, you are not alone. That's certainly the boat that I am in, and at least based on conversations with friends, it seems most other people are in this boat too. It's a boat where many of us could name two members of Radiohead or the fronts people of LCD Sound System or um, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, but if the thing required to dock said boat at some port is informing the harbor master of those responsible for writing or performing I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus, well, shit. Anchors away, my friends. Tommy Connor wrote it, by the way. Jimmy Boyd sang it. Connor was an English songwriter who wrote many songs, but whose only other real claim to fame is the lyrics for The Story of a Soldier from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Sure. 
Boyd had a number three hit in Australia in 1966, a song titled I Would Never Do That, but I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus is his most notable achievement by far. And also just a brief digression here, not on Tommy Connor or Jimmy Boyd, but I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus itself. I have recently learned that there are two kinds of people in the world. The kind who thinks mommy is legit kissing Santa, engaging in some yuletide infidelity, and the kind who has realized that Santa is, in fact, daddy in costume. I bring this up only because I recently, like very, very recently, went from being one type to the other type. Listen, I just never thought about it, okay? Don't judge me. Anyway, the history of pop carol writing is filled with these sorts of characters. Not mommy kissers, but the Tommy Connors and the Jimmy Boyds. People who have one, maybe two successes under their belt. The most notable of which is a carol. Studwell collects a bunch of them in a paper titled From Jingle Bells to Jingle Bell Rock. And we're going to talk about a few of them. So, Jingle Bell Rock was written by Joseph C. Beale and James R. Booth in 1957, both of whom were American PR and advertising dudes and who, as far as I can tell, wrote no widely released music before or after. The recording which popularized their song was made by Bobby Helms, an American country singer. In 1934, J. Fred Coots and Haven Gillespie wrote Santa Claus is Comin' to Town. Both were Tin Pan Alley songwriters who cranked out work after work. They also wrote the jazz standard You Go to My Head, performed by Billie Holiday and Louis Armstrong. Santa Claus is Comin' to Town was popularized first by banjo player Harry Resser and vocalist Tom Sachs. Their radio performance sent sheet music sales through the chimney. Winter Wonderland was written in 1934 by Felix Bernard and Dick Smith. It was recorded originally by Richard Himber, with later versions by Johnny Mercer, Perry Como, and Johnny Mathis. Catherine Kennicott Davis in 1941 wrote Little Drummer Boy. It was made famous by a 1958 recording by the Harry Simeone Chorale, named after Harry Moses Simeone, an American conductor and composer who is most famous for, you guessed it, his arrangement of Little Drummer Boy. Though his chorale's rendition of Do You Hear What I Hear was also a hit. And finally, which is not to say that we've reached the end of the classic carol canon authored by vague individuals, far from it. Only, I assume, the end of your patience for hearing point by point about them. In 1857, James Lord Pierpont, the perennially underemployed son of famous New England poet and minister John Pierpont, wrote what's largely considered the first popular Christmas carol, Jingle Bells, originally titled One Horse Open Sleigh in Medford, Massachusetts. James Pierpont wrote a number of songs, but this was his most famous by a snowy mile. It was recorded a couple times in Pierpont's life. None of the wax cylinder copies survive. Um, it became a Christmas standard and one of the most sung songs in the world by the early 20th century. It's been recorded at this point by countless people. And actually, here, a medium digression on the history of Jingle Bells and its entrance into the public ear. Pierpont wrote songs mostly for the local minstrel shows of Boston and later Atlanta. An inspection of the full original lyrics for Jingle Bells betrays a strong resemblance, it turns out, to the norms of a popular racist theatrical tradition which commodified blackness as a comedic sign of stupidity and laziness. Jingle Bells, it stands to reason, is a minstrel song. I'll put a link in the show notes to a paper by Kina Hamill titled The Story I Must Tell, Jingle Bells in the Minstrel Repertoire, published in the September 2017 edition of Theater Survey, which goes into this in great and utterly fascinating detail. And one more thing before we wrap this jingle digression up. Did you know? Because I didn't. The jingle in Jingle Bells isn't an adjective. It's an imperative verb. Those are not jingle bells. The song is telling you to jingle bells for safety because you're dashing through the snow. I, I had no idea. This is right up there with Mama Kissing Santa Daddy. So all these songs that we know very, very well, they were made largely by people we don't know. 
The Carol is, Studwell writes, in general, the domain of the obscure. The vast majority of carols are anonymous from folk sources or are the most important artistic creation of little-known persons. They're popular songs made by unknown people. So could it be that fame somehow hinders a modern Christmas song's ability to become a classic? But okay, now we're at the tough part. What is a classic besides, you know, something that's old? Normally, when talking about the classics, we're discussing either cars or literature. I'm no gearhead, so uh, we're going to go the other route and see if there's anything useful about literary classics for thinking about yuletide merriment in song form. Once we understand what makes a classic, hopefully we'll be able to see why there are relatively few of the Christmas music variety as of late. So, okay, how do we go about this? Well, luckily... Italo Calvino, the Italian author of Invisible Cities, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, and other amazing works of postmodern literature, put together a system for recognizing and describing classics in his book, Why Read the Classics. It's a 14-point long system. Yeah, don't worry. We're going to breeze frostily through this. I've reordered it, and I've greatly simplified a lot of his points. So Calvino says that you find people rereading, not reading the classics. A classic, he writes, is never exhausted by rereading. If you do encounter someone who is themselves encountering a classic for the first time, it's just as treasured an experience for them as for a repeat customer. Classics may give the first timer the impression that they're rereading something that they've never actually read before. Relatedly, classics, he tells us, lodge themselves in the collective unconscious. They become stuck in our imagination and shared by the masses. When reading classics, we feel the presence of the works which inspired them, and we feel their own influence out in the world. The classics generate a critical discourse, but they always shake off its effects, he says. Through critical reputation, we may think that we know a classic work, but it's only upon direct investigation that we learn a classic is more complex than critique could ever uncover. Calvino also makes the point that classics often represent the whole universe back to their readers. He says everyone has their own classic. Like, mine may be Borges' Labyrinths or James Joyce's Ulysses because those books contain insights that I see reflected constantly in my experiences in the world. Finally, he says, a classic relegates the noise of the present to a background hum. A noise which, at the same time, a classic can't exist without. A classic is meaningful even, and perhaps especially, in times and places where a present that is totally incompatible holds sway. Now, most of this ring ding ding a ling's true for carols, I think. It's rare to find people who haven't heard them, and even after constant exposure, we still find new things in them. We've even done that a few times this episode. Carol classics have certainly reproduced and impacted the tradition of holiday music, both sonically, with the tropes of bells and ringing and choral arrangements, as well as in their subject matter, involving largely weather-related phenomena or reactions to it during Christmas in the Northern Hemisphere. Christmas music is persistent. That's the topic of this very episode, which I should also point out counts as critical discourse, I think. And Christmas music is persistent regardless of a seemingly incompatible present moment. What does Nat King Cole's version of Mel Torme's Christmas song address about today? Not a thing. Doesn't matter. According to BMI, it's the most played Christmas song ever, and I've heard it a dozen times since November. He's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh. What's lacking, it seems, is the ability for carols to reflect the audience's universe back to them. And, I mean, as far as how most people use Christmas music, that sounds about right. We don't listen to carols the way that we listen to 
Phil Ox, Elliot Smith, Nina Simone, or Lori Anderson. We don't search for some truth within them, but dance, prance, and comet around them. Christmas music just maybe isn't meant to reflect the universe back to its listeners. With subject matter that's already religion adjacent, if crimbo tunes aim at epiphany or poetics, they risk veering into spiritual territory, which could then make them church music. And that's a different thing, and more the old school carols territory. Following Studwell's lead, Christmas music's power is that year after year, it unites people in a common celebratory mood. Christmas music isn't primarily to be plumbed for meaning, but used to gather friends and family and strangers at the mall. A classic carol has many hallmarks of a classic classic, but instead of containing a whole universe, it has an almost atomic simplicity. It's easy to remember, easy to play and to sing. It's short and easy to hear again and 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 again. I wonder if, then, this simplicity is defeated by a notable author. If a piece of Christmas music is too personality-driven or has too much context, do you end up getting a Lady Gaga song about Christmas and not a Christmas song by Lady Gaga? Does Justin Bieber write a Christmas carol or a Justin Bieber song about mistletoe? In the age of fandom allegiances, celebrity gossip, and conspicuous consumption, stylistic trappings and broad associations with any given pop star could undercut a holiday song's chances at becoming a classic. There are counter-arguments, of course. Among them, Mariah's All I Want for Christmas is You and Wham's Last Christmas, both of which I think it's worth pointing out are Christmas songs kind of in the same way um, Die Hard is a Christmas movie, It's the setting, like Christmas is the setting, but it's not really the premise. But okay, I get you, um, and I offer the following explanation. 1994's All I Want for Christmas is You very expertly channels some sonic standards of yesteryear without getting hokey. It's got strong backup vocals, big ol' ringing bells, and a decidedly R&B girl group vibe, something that's even referenced in the song's second music video. The first music video shows grainy, square-aspect, home-movie-style footage of Mariah playing in the snow with Santa, and I think in sound and feel, form and content, we can get a sense of how this song became an instant classic. It was expertly nostalgic the moment it appeared, working very smartly against the ultra-pop fame and the expected musical and visual style of its creator. It debuted at number six on the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart, and it sunk to 83 on the Hot 100 by 2000. But as of recording this episode, it has reached the top 10 of Billboard's Hot 100 for the first time ever. Spotify recently announced that it is the number one streamed holiday song. 1984's Last Christmas is just a good-ass song. Michael Kezin, who made the documentary Jingle Bell Rocks about quote-unquote offbeat Christmas music, told the Washington Post that modern Christmas songs can feel calculated. They're referencing those familiar tropes and all those cliches, and they're grasping at the kind of songwriting that no longer exists. Last Christmas, for me at least, is perfectly uncalculated, eschewing most tropes except for those bells, and it's survived on a combination of plain old catchiness, solid performance, and increasingly a mid-level 80s nostalgia that it's kind of just grown into. When it debuted, it hit number two in the UK singles chart, sank to number 53 by 2010, but in 2017 is back to number one as of recording this episode. And lest we want to attribute this success to George Michael's unfortunate passing, the song has been rising in the charts around Christmas every year since 2010. So here's what we've learned. These songs were popular when they were released, but 20 to 30 years later, they're more popular. 
Worth noting, though, these songs are experiencing their height of popularity at a moment different from their authors. Could the contemporary success of these songs be the first slivers of evidence for Mariah and Wham's slow fade into obscurity? Hey, hey. Cold, I know. Another way to look at this is that the inviting simplicity of a carol isn't defeated by notable authors, but develops over time. And so these two pop hits and every older carol don't contain a universe, but fill an increasingly large void. They feed a ravenous hunger for that which we cannot ultimately have. A hunger which movies, video games, books, and TV try constantly to satisfy, but which seemingly grows more insatiable with each bite. The hunger is to return to where we can't, to relive what has passed. Of course, I speak of nostalgia. It's an easy answer, that's for sure. Christmas itself is nostalgic, even naive, cemented in the childhood glee of snow days and presents. What we want from the music of the season may be something simple, familiar, hearkening, whether it's to adolescence, the late 20th century, or both. But I don't know, this take feels naive itself. The desire for new perspectives and bold reimaginings of long unquestioned norms is sizable. In spite of, and maybe because, of the parade of remakes, covers, prequels, and reboots. So, where does this leave us? A classic carol is an infinitely repeatable song shared by groups of people, and maybe most of the ones we know have obscure authors because famous people can put off an audience? We have a few examples of increasingly beloved carols written by celebrities, but is that because of a current nostalgia trend? Is it because those celebrities are becoming more obscure? Why does it seemingly take 20 to 30 years for any Christmas song to stick when we all decided on Cormac McCarthy's The Road, like, immediately? Probably there's no one answer. It's distracting context or seeming calculation. It's nostalgia. It's time being the harshest critic and a bunch of other things. But I will say this. It's worth confronting the fact that Christmas music is literally, and by definition, not for everyone. Studwell's conception of a carol is useful, but it may be charitable. A music focused on a religious holiday, no matter how secularized that holiday becomes, isn't for diverse and varied segments of society. You're right, though. Jingle Bells and Let It Snow and other songs don't contain the word Christmas, but like Calvino says, classics contain an imprint of their inspiration, which they carry forward into the world. The Christmasness is embedded, and at this point, it's inextricable. This is maybe why I don't love Christmas music, but why I find it interesting. I'm not turned off by a celebrity context or commercial calculation as much as its contradiction. I feel both beckoned and pushed away by this tradition of songwriting. For all the work it does to feel cozy, loving, celebratory, and welcoming, those factors struggle against a spiritual genealogy which is uh, complicated especially for someone who got kicked out of Sunday school for asking too many questions. Whoops. Even for reasonably secular holiday pop songs, this genealogy probably complicates its broad appeal. There are poetic and sonic markers that signal a spiritual inclination when, on a literal level, none may actually be present. Still, I think we can and should feel hopeful for a future where there is an end-of-the-year musical and songwriting tradition that's maximally inclusive, that lives up truly to the Studwell conception. There is something comforting, I think, about so many of the carol tropes, sonic and otherwise. The question is, can those tropes be transported to a new tradition with all of the tidings and maybe a little bit less of the Yule. It's no small order, but were that the case, I think we may see a holiday hit more often than once every 10 to 20 years.
My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND and me at Mike Rignetta. Reasonably Sound is a proud listener-supported podcast. Thank you so much to every current patron and supporter. The show would not be possible without you. If you want to help out, you can give a per-episode donation on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound, or you can support me in all my internet endeavors, including but not limited to reasonably sound, with a monthly donation on drip at d.rip forward slash micrognetta. The Reasonably Sound theme and act break music are by Will Stratton, and its visual design is by Tita Tep. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, and a peaceful New Year. I hope you get to spend it with whoever you call your family, and that 2018 brings you happiness, success, and lots of super interesting noises. I'll talk to you soon. Mm.